you know, I'm personally inspired by all sorts of stuff. Um, being a rhythm guitarist, I really think I understand the importance of it. Um, by you know, when you watch someone like James Hetfield from Metallica, we got the the chance to stand up the side of the stage and watch him every night, listen to his monitor, and he plays so perfect. And uh, you know, people don't realize how important it is. That really binds everything together, and he's just so tight. Um, so I think you know, not everyone out there, you know, is destined to be a solo guitarist. And I think that there's such an important aspect about playing great rhythm. Um, you know, some other great rhythm players, for example, Guns N' Roses, you know, Slash is an amazing lead guitarist, but when you listen to those albums, the way it's all binded together with the rhythm guitar, just such great feel and such feeling is so important. And if it wasn't for that, you know, the solos are amazing, but I think you need to mesh everything together. And that's something we really try and do with Avenged Sevenfold. When I joined Avenged Sevenfold, I couldn't play rhythm guitar worth a shit. And so, you know, I had to practice and it was a total different thing. And, you know, when you're used to noodling, it's hard to get that in the mindset of, you know, just getting in there, and getting that kind of stuff going down. Um, but he helped me a lot. And uh, we both incorporated a lot of lead playing um, as well into our harmonies and stuff. So we kind of just mix and matched and kind of like became hybrids of each other, you know. And so he's playing a lot of lead stuff. I'm playing a lot of rhythm stuff. And kind of blended it together, started listening to more of the groove, you know, instead of just, you know, a bunch of snobby guitar geeks and stuff. Yeah, and I think a great way um, to practice that is to have a drummer, you know, preferably someone that has a good groove and that can play with decent time. Well, it just makes your life completely that much easier. I mean, it's, it's impossible to play to a bad drummer, at least with our experience. We've known him and we played with him for our whole life and he he always had a great groove and uh, while his chops were developing his group his groove was all, always there and it made it very easy for us to just sit there and, and lay stuff down and not have to be worried and that we're getting off time it was just the groove always felt natural within our band because he was so tight and not just fast but everything he played was in on time with a groove even though it was going at you know 100 miles per hour it still grooved very well so it makes our job that much more easy. I think for us, it was really important that we understood. Because in the early days, me and him were kind of doing our own things. You know, our drummer was staying pretty solid. And we didn't really realize it until we started hearing some recordings of us and realizing that, wow, we got to tighten up. You know, we really got to find ourselves. We got to get in the pocket with our drummer. And that just really happened naturally with uh, a little bit of, you know, consciousness of the fact that we were getting a little sloppy. You know, we just you just try and you get in the pocket and then you play so many shows. I mean, the best practice is repetition when it comes to, you know, playing with the same drummer and all of a sudden, like, it's like he's an extension of me at this point, just a second nature when I can run around stage and play and just to stay in the pocket with, with him. And, and I think that's really an important thing that, you know, for young guitarists or anybody, um, that anyone that ever wants to play in a band, is how important to... Playing guitar is an amazing thing, but you have to be able to mesh with all your band members. It provides a much more fun experience too. You can just lay back and play a show for all of your fans that are there to see you and play a show for yourself and just have a, a good time and not just be looking back at the dickhead who keeps ruining the song. You know? <laughs> you know, as a rhythm guitar player, it's important to be able to, you know, control your strumming hand very much. You know, the muting is such an important thing and just um, being able to, all, I mean, you can do wonders with just the top two strings, you know, just just doing stuff like that, basically just combining um, like a percussive element um, by tapping on, you know, your bottom string, just keep, and you always come back to that bottom string, so just, and you can do all sorts of cool stuff with that, um, and you get faster and faster at it, and you do, and that's a really a simple thing to do for a beginning guitarist. You're only using two strings, but it's really strengthening your hand. You know, you really want to tighten the, just. And it also helps, you know, for you, you know, to alternate, you know, fingers and, and you get a chance to use your pinky in there. Because that's really an important thing, you know, when you're starting out as a guitarist or at any level, you really need to strengthen every finger so that they can, you know, do what Sinister Gates does and go, go ballistic speed. When I first picked up a guitar, I was playing to a lot of um, just straightforward punk rock stuff as far as rhythm goes. 
it was a lot of downstrokes. It was, in fact, it was all downstrokes. And it wasn't until me and him got together that I started learning, you know, alternate picking, going, you know, back and forth. So I still, my style's a little, a little different because um, I would recommend, you know, to learn by by going up and down, you know, because it'll it'll really make your hand faster when you're moving through all all the strings. Um, for me personally, it's just kind of a habit that I haven't broken, but but I, I try and mix it up and do you know alternate picking. But uh, you know, it's one of those things that makes me a little bit a little bit unique because I taught myself and uh, so I use a lot of just downstroke stuff. And by getting fast at something like that, you know, it's helped me with uh, like muting really fast because it's really important to be able to mute fast. You know, if you got to keep up with a fast drummer, if you want to, you know, just full thrash riff. <laughs> I and mean, that was a riff that I'd written when I was really young. That's just me trying to go as fast as I could. And, and it's not until, you know, you realize you have to play it, you can tighten it up and just, that's the main premise of that, you know, just. It's definitely really good to know. I'm a huge fan of, of muting. Um, it's just important. It adds such an element to the making just the rhythm fit nicely with the drums, you know, being able to just. That really just tightens it up with the drums instead of just being open all the time or just muting all the time, just being able to fluctuate with what you do. And that's just a stylistic thing. A lot of that metal stuff is. You know, it just gives it that edge, that heaviness to it. Another great thing for practice, and it also sounds cool, is, is to separate everything, you know, play it as fast as you possibly can, but slowly it starts like this. And you can get definitely a different element. It's a, a little bit more difficult, you know, but it's uh, definitely one to throw in there um, right off the bat and start practicing it. I think it started off not ha not having a metronome, but I played with a uh, uh, I jammed with a bunch of different kids, you know, from around my area, and so I kind of got sort of a shitty sense of time because none of us were any good. Um, but it's always good to have a click or a, a metronome or whatever to use as a reference, say once even a year. I mean, just sitting with a metronome one time will definitely get your feel a lot better, and you'll have a concept of time, and it just and it and it works right away. It's not one of those things where it takes years to develop good time with a metronome. I think it's just something that you want to use as an occasion to just tighten yourself up, you know, and just bring that perspective back. But if you can play to a metronome, and I practice to a metronome, I definitely recommend it. You know, the more metronome you have, the better you, yeah. your feel will be. I think another good thing, you know, um, to do, you know, if you get your chance to find a song that you like and, and get the tablature for it, is take a look at the tablature and really figure it out and just play along with the album, you know? Just um, put it in your stereo and, and play along to that and the bands you like. And you'll start developing characteristics of the, you know, the players that you like. And um, you do that with enough bands and over enough time, you start developing all these great characteristics and you kind of make it your own and gives you your own personality and style. And, and like what you'd said, I do think a metronome is really important. I don't even think I understood the concept of a metronome until we were, when I was, locked away rehearsing by myself and practicing and um, for you know a couple albums ago just really really trying to strengthen up my you know my picking hand as well as make my fingers go faster um, but you know you you really can't go faster if you want to learn how to play faster you need a metronome that way you can start at a certain speed and just inch up you know one beat per minute two beats per minute just slightly go faster and faster that way your fingers are staying strong and uh um, very consistent because if you just practice all of a sudden real fast, you can develop really sloppy um, tendencies that will be hard to break. So a metronome is a really good thing for if you want, you know, fast and precision. And I'm going to add to what you said a couple of uh, things ago. Um, when you're learning songs or whatever, I'm a big fan of actually broadening your ear and transcribing stuff as opposed to buying like tablet. I mean, it's good if you can't figure it out. Tablature is great, but I think it's a very important thing to just try and learn those things completely by ear 
And then when you think you got it, you know, then go by the tab book and make sure that you got it right or change a couple of things. And then that'll develop your ear as well. Instead of always learning shit wrong, you'll know what you kind of hear. You know, you'll might, you might hear a fourth instead of a fifth and a chord or just whatever it may be. You know, those things kind of correct you after you've already done the work. We pretty much just write the parts and uh, kind of give it to you know, each other, you know, if the drummer will write a part, Zachy will write a part, then I'll kind of do my take on it, you know, and, and start arranging it or whatever. But that's pretty, I think we pretty much arrange stuff ourselves. And so when we give him a part, we let him go. And then if he comes on to something like we, he, he misses it and we think, oh, he should have gone there. Then we'll say, hey, you should try doing it this way. You know, this is what kind of what I hear in my head. And, and usually it's, you know, vice versa. It's, you know, a guy like of that caliber is, usually laying down the right thing. You just jam it out and yeah, try a bunch of different things. He goes home and thinks about it a little bit. Then you have another jam session about it and it just turns out from there. Yeah, and, and having um, everyone in Events Unfold writes music. And so our drummer will come up with something and he has a lot of like more straightforward just, you know. The riff by itself is pretty cool. But what makes it great is the fact that our drummer um, he has such a strong beat and in such good groove. And he's got a crazy, uh, I don't even know what he's doing, but he makes, yeah. makes that riff so exciting by uh, just adding, and it makes the song you know, so important. And I think when you hear the song as a guitarist or just a fan of music, you'll be so pumped up. But the riff by itself is, is just a riff, pretty cool. you know. Might be a riff that we might have thrown away if he didn't have such a great um, vision for it. And, and he really blended the drums with it amazing. And on top of that, um, you know, Sinister will throw, you know, octaves or a cool little, like, uh, like almost like a spacey little solo. It's nothing, you know, crazy technical or anything, but it just, it's just so many flavors. And they all, all together, that's what makes something great. We actually produced this one ourselves. And so it was kind of hard for us to, uh, I mean, we got it all figured out now, but it's, it's a difficult task, you know. Um, throwing away songs or throwing away parts and stuff, but as producers, you really got to just, you know, listen to everybody and just because it's like there's a solo in there or something that you wrote at that, that that was, you know, based, the, the song was based on, you can't let that dissuade you, you know, you have to look at it from the outside as producers and stuff. I think we're, we're really good at that. We're good at arranging um, our songs, coming together, listening to each other. We all parallel and thought, even though we come from these vast different genres such as uh, Mr. Bungle to Pantera to Metallica, you know, just to Danny Elfman scores. I mean, we love it all. And so it all, it all gets thrown into the, into the blender. We all love it and we all know how to arrange it. And we all know, you know, when we're trying to polish a turd or when we have something really good. And, and the thing is, is on, especially on this album, writing and uh, recording it ourselves and producing it, um, we've all been faced with having to throw away, you know, you know, our, our pet or our, you know, our babies. Like, I wrote this riff, and I absolutely loved it. It turned into a really cool song, but it wasn't the best song on the album, and it didn't really add, um, it didn't add anything to the album that wasn't already there. And we, had, we didn't want, you know, a couple songs that sounded the same. We wanted each song to just kick your ass and be awesome. Right. And, we, you know, it was, it's hard to throw away a riff that you love, but I still think it'd be a great riff for kids to learn, and, and you know, someday they will, I hope. And on this album, everyone was forced, like I said, to throw away something they love. He has one of my favorite solos he's ever written. That it's uh, going to be on a B side. Didn't actually make the album, but the way the solo came out is he was just sitting there, you know, trying stuff, and it's just this unbelievable solo, you know. And it's almost a crime that it's not going to be heard on the album, but the song as a whole, just um, our singer had to throw away, you know, songs that his voice just felt great and opened up. We're pretty pretty rough on ourselves. And then just, to, just for good measure, we had to make sure and uh, bum the drummer out, too, by taking out some of his favorite drum parts, because we're, we're equal opportunities in Avenged Sevenfold. So yeah, a different a way, way that we kind of arrange stuff. There's a couple of different things um, that we do or whatever, but you know, basically you'll have your chords or whatever, and then you will just do some stuff such as. I'll start out, and then. You kind of just come up with something, you know, basically like an octave just splitting off and doing its own thing. It makes a really uh, good, 
gives it a nice texture and it gives it more notes and makes the song way more interesting. So it's something we definitely do a lot. It's uh, highly recommended. So I'll, I'll play this song like. Sometimes I like to have subtler lead lines in, you know, I've done it primarily in choruses, but you can do it anytime that you want or whatever. And it's just, you know, some based on what what's happening in the chord, you don't want to step on the, the singer's melody and you usually want to keep it more motif-y. Although sometimes in the past I've had just like, just they were more lead lines and within themselves, but it tends to get a little bit messy there. So you just kind of want to keep them simple. I'll, I'll just start and you come in whenever. Something simple. I mean, you can do whatever the hell you want for anything. Just kind of going along. It, it adds a lot of, adds a lot of texture. Uh, makes the part much more interesting. And on top of it, like when we're in the studio, we could go in and. Um, on top of that, you can you know throw a duel on it, where you just throw in the you know a melody onto that, and it, then it gives it you know a, you you know have dueling guitars, and that's that's a great thing too. One, two, three, four. <laughs> As long as you got one guy in the band, and you know they can do a little bit of theory, I wish it. I wish it wasn't me, but sometimes it makes my <laughs> job a little harder. But you know, but um, definitely like you have a minor chord or whatever. You got a D minor. Uh, that's probably the first inversion I think is built on the. It's got the minor third on top. It's good to know, and then with major you. Got, Obviously, we write in minor. <laughs> Some of my favorite guitar players of all time, probably number one as far as like just the metal and the feel of, and just being able to just be one with a guitar would have to be Dimebag Darrell. I think that guy's just a phenomenal freak. He has unbelievable feel. He's created sounds from a guitar that nobody can do just from a guitar and amp. I'm talking about throwing some pedals down, and he just fucking can rape and pillage his guitar. Um, Slash, one of the tastiest guys of all time. Um, <laughs> it doesn't sound so good. <laughs> well, I, I have experience. Are we talking about guitar? Um, yeah, he, he just, his melodic sense is <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Let's see, I, I listen to a bunch of different dudes. Uh, and then there's the whole jazz world where I, I have almost forgotten about it at this point in my life, but it was pretty much all that I wanted to do from 13 years old to about 21. Um, guys like Joe Pass, uh, Frank Gambale, John Schofield, all those guys are just freaks and their melodic sense is absolutely amazing. And so I kind of try that to, I try to apply that to Event Sevenfold by just using like, you know, flat fives or whatever, just, just throwing it up a little bit. Um, and just kind of giving a different dimension to that. So that's where that comes from. Yeah, we do kind of a chromatic thing um, that we put a duel over and it sounds pretty cool, you know? <laughs> and that part, um, yeah, that particular thing actually helped my playing a lot because in a song we, you know, He's doing a solo, and then we meet up halfway and do this chromatic, you know, this duel. And I'm just doing the harmony to what he's doing, but it just has this amazing feel. Um, it sounds great. And at first, it was all new to me, you know, playing rhythm. So it was my first kind of chance to do something, you know, solo-esque in this dual solo that, um, that happens in our song. But it really helped me to learn, like, to play faster, and it helped me with, you know, alternate picking by going up and down. One, two, three, four. Right here. And I 
kind of like to switch up rhythms and stuff, so I kind of start off doing, um, uh, I believe those are 16ths into 32nd uh, note triplets, or 16th note triplets, whichever one. <laughs> Hold on. So, and the same vibe goes up for the whole thing, you know, but you kind of keep the motif and then like I'm a motif kind of guy and then doing something a little bit special at the end or whatever. So. so that's basically that one, you know, it's kind of, it's definitely got a motif. It's faster and it doesn't mean just because it's faster that you just have to fucking play fast and and not have something specially designed for it or just be a little bit, you know, more creative with it. <laughs> 